everyone, I'd like to introduce Olivia Stella. She is doing a talk called Airplane Mode, Cybersecurity at 30,000 Feet. Thank you all for joining us and take it away, Olivia. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Hi, everyone. My name is Olivia Stella. I'm going to talk to you today about um, cybersecurity in the aviation industry. And like for every good presenter, we always have our infamous disclaimer slide. So just wanted to give a heads up. This is a presentation based off of my experiences in the aviation industry and other past experiences in the engineering field. So nothing's endorsed by any of my uh, current or past employers. And I really like my job, so just want to be able to keep doing conferences like Wild West Hacking Fest. More importantly, everything in this presentation was found on the open internet. Nothing is secret or uh, proprietary, so you can find it if you want afterwards. I do have my slides on my website, oliviastell.com, if you want to find that. And I provide a reference list at the end of that slide deck. That QR code that you see right now is a survey. I'm always really interested in what people want to know about aviation cybersecurity. So if there's something I didn't cover in this topic, let me know. If I hit all the marks, awesome too. Um, I always want to try to evolve my presentation. I had someone from a past conference come up to me and say, hey, I want to know more about the regulatory side of aviation cybersecurity. And I actually did a new presentation for that. So always interested in knowing what the audience wants to hear. So a little bit about me. Over 12 years ago, I started as a comp sci major by degree, but I found out that 100% uh, software development doesn't spark joy. But I love interacting with people, especially in the engineering space. So when I'm not doing curling, which is what I'm showing in the picture, I love doing anything I can cyber related and learning more. When I started in my career, I was really fortunate that I got to work on a lot of transportation programs right out of college. So really early, I started on an air command and control program doing certification tests. I worked on a GPS program that was used by aircraft. And then I got really lucky that I found my way into an in-flight entertainment company doing software integration and test. And my focus and my team was on the flight crew terminal that the crew uses to control the IFV and its functionality. And once I was there for a couple of years, I got an awesome break into product security. And that's when I had my Eureka moment and that I'm above cybersecurity, I'm never going back. And aviation is just like this cool niche that you don't really find anywhere. And now I've been geeking out in this industry for over six years. So something I want to cover on before I get into more of the technical information is the scope of this presentation. I've actually had people walk out after the first two minutes because they thought I was going to talk about hacking planes. And this is the complete opposite of that concept. So it's just to give a high level of aviation cybersecurity. So including some of the regulatory aspects, the players that are involved in the space, and the components of the aviation ecosystem. So if anybody works in the industry, some of this might be an overview for you or really high level, but that's the scope I'm going to cover today. Cybersecurity regulation in the aviation industry, it's very similar, but it depends on what country you're in. A supplier or manufacturer may have to comply with several different government agencies. So this presentation, I'm going to focus on the U.S. regulation, which is very similar to European regulation and, and those associated authorities. Specifically for aviation cybersecurity, there's three main documents. And here comes the mass of acronyms and numbers that I'm going to talk about. So I actually took a boot camp on these documents because they're really, really big and they're perfect reading material if you uh, want to go to sleep at night and you have insomnia. But I'm going to go over um, three key documents. So the first one is DO 326A and it's airworthiness for security process specification. So what is that? Why we need that is when safety assessments are created for aircraft, it was initially developed with a focus on failure of onboard systems. The so keyword you're gonna hear me say throughout this whole presentation is safety of flight. Everything revolves around that. So the specifications at the time weren't focused on failures caused by malicious intent. So this document helps to fill that gap by defining the security scope during the certification process. And that could be for new systems or modifications to existing systems. So 
in addition to the scope, it also has a list of requirements regarding security assessments and effectiveness requirements. So for number two is a nice, really, really thick, big specification. This is DO 356A, Airworthiness Security Methods and Considerations. So what is this guy? It explains the type of methods that could be used to show um, compliance from the previous specification, DO 326A. So for example, if you're developing a security architecture, and your corresponding measures, what are some examples? If you needed assurance guidance for verification activities like threat assessments, what systems should you be logging in your environment for security issues so that they can be properly monitored? A lot of guidance is provided in this document. For me, as someone who works for an air operator or an airline, the third document, DO 355, is something that we really care about. 355 is information security guidance for continuing airworthiness. So that's a bunch of words saying that once you have this beautiful shiny plane, how do you make sure that it continues to be um, safe for flight and continue to be airworthy in regards to cybersecurity? And also who is responsible? So this guy highlights incident response and management practices. What are the personnel roles you need to have in your organization so that you can properly manage this type of aircraft? and uh, the development of an aircraft information security program. So there's also additional guidance in regards to who needs to follow these three directive order documents. And it's aircraft with special conditions. Now, what does that mean? And what causes an aircraft to have a special condition? Well, all aircraft do not necessarily have special conditions. And uh, there's a great quote that I found in one of these guidance documents escaping me right now. But it's specifically, it's this airplane will have a novel or unusual design features when compared to the state of technology envisioned and the airworthiness standards for transport category airplanes. These new connectivity capabilities may result in security vulnerabilities to the aircraft's critical systems. For these design features, the applicable airworthiness regulations do not contain adequate or appropriate safety standards for protection and security of airplane systems and data networks against unauthorized access. And that paragraph keeps going on. But the gist of that statement is saying, back when the original operational standards were created for legacy or older aircraft, they didn't have in scope that there could potentially be malicious activity on newer types of systems. So aircraft that are tagged with special conditions, so for example, the 787, 737 MAX, and A350, they all have newer onboard networking systems that these brand new um, conditions help to cover to make sure that the cybersecurity of that new network and the space of the aircraft is appropriately documented. So special condition aircraft also have to have something called an aircraft network security plan that each airline and the uh, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs have to work together to build. And they ensure that any system modifications or update don't negatively impact the continuing airworthiness due to any cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And this ongoing agreement is, is a living document between the manufacturers, the air operators, and your regulatory body. So for U.S. carriers, we develop this plan with an agreement with the manufacturer. We send it off to the FAA where they sign off on it and agree that, yes, you have the proper scope to manage these special condition aircraft. And when developing these ANSP or Aircraft Network Security Program type documents, we do leverage some of the top frameworks in the industry. So we leverage NIST DSF in regards to sub several of the other ones. And I'll, I'll tag on that a little bit later as well. So the main takeaway from the regulatory aspect is that these documents and guidance emphasize the safety of flight in regards to um, cybersecurity by using a defense in-depth approach. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So who are the players in this space? There's a lot of them, and they all have equally important roles. And each of them need to follow the regulatory aspects to a certain extent that I mentioned previously. There are a handful of lists of who are the players that are involved, but I really like the compilation that was referenced in the 2018 U.S. National Strategy for Aviation Security. So this was a U.S. government produced document, and they refer to them as the six A's. So the first one would be the aircraft. 
Um, there are over 24,000 commercial flights daily over the U.S. Um, in traditional flying capacity. Today might be a little bit different in light of what's going on in the world, but this category includes government and private aircraft in addition to commercial. For airlines, what's highlighted in the airline section is that there are airlines of multiple sizes covering all different functional scopes of operation and maintenance. And they're considered responsible for several different enterprise networks, and it spans more than just the aircraft. It expands customer reservation systems, if you think about it, of how you book tickets through the airline and also the ground systems. You want to make sure that you get your bags where they're going. But my favorite sentence in this document was referring to how an airline is managed has an impact on its safety and the security of the aviation ecosystem. So that just highlights how every player has an equal and important impact to that ecosystem. Airlists were a new term before I joined this industry, and they're just the cargo version of airlines. And one may think that, oh, you're just a cargo carrier. You don't have as many restrictions as passenger carriers, but it's the complete opposite. They follow the same regulations that we do. And if you think about it, they have a greater economic impact. So the International Air Transport Association, or IATA, references that over 35% of the world's trade by value, about $6 trillion, is being transported by airlift carriers. I am someone who loves my Amazon Prime, so that is something that I do care about. Next are airports, and there's over 44,000 airports globally and about 19,000 in the U.S. And when you think about airports, traditionally the big hubs pop into your mind at first, but this also includes helipads, package delivery hub, and logistical airports. And if you're not familiar with logistical airports, they are cool airports often in the middle of nowhere where you see scenes filled for movies or where airlines store their aircraft. In addition to the physical airports, the entities that run the airports are also included in this category. The fifth category is aviation management. So that would be your international and national regulatory bodies that manage the operation and administration of your ecosystem. So for the U.S., that would be the FAA, EASA in Europe, and a lot of countries have their own individual civil aviation authorities. So this is where air traffic control would reside out of these group of players. The last and final group is categorized as actors. And I sort of feel that it's a catch-all bucket. And it's not my favorite on how they have it defined from the standpoint, and this is how it's quoted, people or entities who operate, maintain, or utilize any aspect of the aviation ecosystem. I think the scope is very wide and it includes anybody from original equipment manufacturers, suppliers, contractors, and they even reference nefarious actors in this group. And I, and I don't think that's necessarily fair to, to group it all. I'm personally like to give you things out a little bit more to be specific, but they reference it from activities coming from the outside it is applicable, insider threat could be a thing, but a lot of these groups work very hard to secure their portion of the aviation ecosystem. So now we're gonna dive into the ecosystem. When I first started, it, there's a lot of information. So I like to break it down easily and most people can relate to being a passenger if they've flown. So I like to think of it what happens before, um, after, during and after the flight. This graphic is courtesy of NASA and I like it because it gives somewhat of an operational perspective of the players who are involved, but bear in mind that it is a government perspective, but most importantly, it captures the major components. So starting before the flight, before you even think of planning your trip or buying your ticket, there's a lot of activities happening in the background so that you can book that flight or ship your cargo. So if we go back to the certification that I talked about earlier in regards to these regulatory guidance, lovely books, the aircraft needs to be certified safe to fly through whatever civil aviation authority that the aircraft resides in. And you also need to make sure that you have staff that's approved to fly that aircraft as well. And in the U.S., there's also auxiliary groups. You need to have TSA personnel that are able to support the airport operations so that you can get through security. Uh, in the U.S., there's also Customs and Border Patrol. You have your airport ground crews, your airline gate, and flight attendants. From a planning aspect, what staff is needed for that? You want to make sure you have a proper flight crew for a wide body plane, the huge 787s or the A380, as opposed to you may only need a, a very small crew for um, regional planes. 
And also, how many flights are needed? Do you need to have more going to your hubs? What type of aircraft do you need to support that? For instance, you wouldn't want to take a regional jet on an international flight. That'd be really, really uncomfortable. And then we jump into reservations. So what options are available to passengers and cargo reservations? Do you need next day delivery? Do you have full internet connectivity on your flight if it is that really long international flight? And everybody needs power because we all need to charge our phones. And what locations can you fly to? So some of those are the high levels of what happens behind the scenes before your flight. During the flight, we see a little bit in regards to what happens while while you're in the air, but there's still more going on behind the scenes. You have the avionics aspect of the aircraft that is in constant communication um, with ground and, and also people on board the aircraft. So the pilots are talking to the flight crew, and then the flight crew has their own cabin functionality that they're able to talk to each other. Then there's the cabin functionality itself that you want to make sure is in state compliance regulatory order, uh, your lighting, any of your safety functions in your lighting crew and passenger fun functionality. You want to make sure your in-flight entertainment's working right. You definitely don't want to be on a really long flight and not have anything to watch. One item that people don't think about is having connectivity so you can get accurate weather readings. Weather is very, very important in regards to the safety of the flight to make sure that it's the most comfortable experience for the passengers, but also for the crew. There's times where the weather could be so severe crew could get hurt moving up and down the aisles, and we definitely don't want that to happen. During that whole process, air traffic management is providing additional navigational information. So tying it back to the weather example, if there happens to be bad weather, can they go fly in a different airspace? Can they take another path? That would be uh, better for everybody on board. And after the flight. So after you land, still more activity in the background. Your plane gets checked again by a certified pilot they do that visual walk around or the new pilot comes onto the flight and there may or may not be maintenance, even though we don't like to be delayed. It's important that that gets done in a timely fashion. But you want to make sure your baggage gets to where it goes. So if that's your final destination, you want to make sure it doesn't get shipped to another location by accident. And make sure that if you do have a connecting flight that you're getting to your right location. So we do our best to make sure that your gates are relatively close to each other because I don't like running across the airport and some of the airports are really big. And then there's also constant communication with ground systems. So sometimes the aircraft need to offload data, potentially do information updates, and that happens behind the scenes as well. So if we put all of that together, we get a really high level of the operational aspect of the aviation ecosystem. And now we have to secure all of this. What is aviation cybersecurity? It is every single system related to the functionality components that I mentioned previously. So I'm going to speak to what I've experienced in the industry. So keep in mind that is from a third party supplier perspective and an airline point of view. So here's another cool graphic that I really like, and it's courtesy of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. They had a 2013 white paper entitled a framework for aviation cybersecurity. And they reference the section where this graphic is located as aviation and the evolution of information and communication technology. And what I really like is that they highlight that the plane was a closed system. This awesome craft was intended to not have the world open to it. And then it expanded due to the demand of the outside industry. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you want more of an understanding of cybersecurity and aviation, I highly recommend reading that right white paper. So let's start with the aircraft itself. So if we think about securing all the data for each parts of the system, it's a lot. You can't do it by yourself, no matter how large of a company you are, and you're dependent on a handful of those other players referenced in the group of the six A's. Also, you have to remember that you're under the watchful eye of your government jurisdiction. So you want to make sure that you're doing everything within compliance. So uh, if you think about the onboard systems of the aircraft, there's some that are native, like the avionics, and then all the way up to uh, third party systems like your passenger internet connectivity and your, your internet systems. So then how do we talk to the rest of the world in regards to those systems? That's when you jump into the communication aspect, taking those onboard avionics systems, how do you talk to the rest of the world? So in the air, you have your Wi-Fi in 
means that calm versus if you're on the ground, you have cellular connections. ACARS is also an in-flight communication aspect as well. On the ground, you have to make sure you have the appropriate infrastructure so that you can adequately uh, transfer data back and forth if needed. And you have to support all that infrastructure to make sure that it is up to date, free from vulnerabilities to the best of your ability. We jump to the external environment. From an airline perspective, uh, there are a lot more external players that are, are indirectly related. So if you think about it, the airport aspect, you have your baggage systems. You want to make sure that anything that's being rerouted is done appropriately, efficiently, and then that ties into ticketing. If someone happened to change their ticket last minute, how does that um, affect where their bag gets sent? And hopefully that's done before their flight and not during their flight so that it goes uh, a little bit more smoothly. And then there's uh, maintenance aspects as well. If you need to pull a plane out, do you have another one located at a nearby hangar? Do you have a flight crew that's certified um, that can actually fly that one as well? And making sure that the communication is constant within those external environments is very important because sometimes they may or may not be owned by the airline versus the airport that you're, you're interacting with. Another level removed, think about the Internet of Things or IoT devices and systems that the third-party companies use that provide additional services. So anytime that catering comes out, they may have a tablet saying, hey, this flight has so many passengers. They have so many um, special needs meals needed. We need twice the amount of people in a cleaning crew to clean a wide body plane versus a narrow body plane. And they're all sharing that infrastructure. And it may be the airport's Wi-Fi. It may be the airline's Wi-Fi if they have um, something that's closer to where they're, they're located. So now you have to secure all that data for each part of that system. So these past few slides have been a, a small peek into the world that I live in right now. I'm going to talk about data just a little bit more. So whenever I get to the slide, people, their eyes light up because I can see in the back of their heads going, Olivia, I want more information about the plane. Tell me more about the plane. So, so this is to feed that need. Before I jump into more distinctive aspects of aviation cybersecurity, I want to go into data domains. And currently for aircraft, uh, we have it divided into three specific domains in our industry right now. And these domains are highlighted sometimes in special conditions, depending on the needs of that specific aircraft. So this is another cool graphic provided by Connected Aviation Today, and that the domains are listed in order of cr criticality to safety of flight. So remember, favorite phrase again, safety of flight. So if, when we start with our first domain, it's the aircraft control domain. And this is the most critical data domain in regards to safety of flight. So this is where all the flight controls happen, the core cabin functions. These, if you look at it from a risk perspective, going back to the regulatory guidance of, hey, what are the methods and considerations that you would need, this domain would have the highest level. So this ties back into defense in depth again. Jumping to the second domain, sort of the middle of the sandwich, it's the Airline Information Services domain, also known as the AISD. There's a, another industry group named ICAO. Uh, they have a description that they noted in 2014 saying that this domain provides services and interconnectivity to other domains while providing a security perimeter. I'm not saying it's a firewall, but if you want to think of it as a security perimeter between the next domain, the passenger domain, and the aircraft control domain, you can see it as that. And the, the AISD can be categorized into two separate subdomains as well. So the first one is an administrative subdomain which provides operational and airline administrative information to both the flight deck and cabin. So you could think of that data as potentially being like weather related information going back and forth from the uh, air traffic control tower, for example. Like if someone sends an air, a cars message, hey, how's this information being communicated? It could be passed through that domain as another safety layer. The second subdomain is passenger support subdomain, which provides information to the passenger system. So it's, it's a great way of thinking of it as like a fork in the road, where as if you're, you're getting information from the ACD and you need to pass it to the third domain, which is the passenger information and entertainment services domain, it's just another layer of protection to make sure that it's getting directed correctly. And more importantly, data flow is restricted in certain aspects. So 
jump into the PISD, which is the Passenger Information and Entertainment Services domain. This is reference of having the most dynamic functionality in order to keep up with the demanding home and office markets. You think about it, everybody's bringing their own devices on the aircraft, and this domain needs to support that. They want internet connectivity, they want streaming media, and we have to be able to support that for almost any type of device with any type of configuration and software package. But this domain also includes other functionality of passengers. So if you have a business class seat and the seat actuators or seat adjustments are controlled via the uh, seat back monitor, or you have a little side panel that says, hey, you can press this button to make the lights turn on with the seat, that also is communicated through, through that system. And one thing I want to emphasize is that a lot of these systems have segmentation within their own networks. So I don't want anybody to think that you can pass one way and, and back. It's very, very segmented, like any good network should be, to have segmentation where it makes sense. And also in our industry where it's a, a need to know for certain data, it's the same thing for the data domains. If someone doesn't need a need to know, then they, they shouldn't have it. So a good example I like to give is some of the in-flight entertainment systems provide the speed that the aircraft is going, their altitude, what's the temperature outside. So that information is often passed through the ISD because they're able to get it through some of the equipment through that layer and then passed down because you don't need it from the aircraft control domain, then you shouldn't have to get it there. And it's all system specific configurations. So, so thinking about how to secure all this data for each part of the system, we have to think about the certain level of risk tolerance as well. So if you think about the, the passenger domain, there's a little bit more of a risk tolerance because you're letting people bring on their own devices and you don't know what they're going to have. So we're going to definitely fortify that more than you think you would need to. A lot of people think, well, it's, it's open Wi-Fi like a Starbucks coffee shop that you'd go to and connect your laptop. But from my past experience, a lot of the vendors put more security features on there than you think that they would need. And, and that makes me feel better knowing that they do care about that aspect of it. And then as you go further on the different data domains, the level of security, if you're peeling back and the infamous layers of the onion, it just keeps getting more and more intense and stringent. So that was a lot of overview information, especially if this is new to you. Thank you. So. To let it digest a little bit, I'm, I'm going to frame it in how do we think this fits in our world. We understand the rules now. We know the players in the space and the ecosystem and the data domains. But how do you treat this really unique environment? A lot of people come from traditional IT backgrounds. They might think it's, it's an IT system. If you happen to be an OT person, you may think, hey, this could be definitely OT related. And when I think of an OT environment, I see electrical grids, water treatment plants, nuclear power plants, specifically facilities that if there was a failure, there's going to be a negative impact to safety of human life. And normally ask people in the audience if, if they have questions or if there's any OT experts in the audience, and then I point them out because I am not an OT ex expert. Go find those people. So if you're an OT expert, hit it up on Discord. I really like to hear your, your side of it as well. But does this mean that the aircraft is an industrial control system? Not exactly, but it's definitely not a regular IT system as well, specifically due to the safety of flight aspect. The more environment becomes open in regards to connectivity, evolving technology, we really see these two areas blur in the middle. And that's the fun part of my job. From the avionics aspect of the aircraft, the components within the aircraft control domain, are really like OT SCADA systems in regards to software, that if something were to happen, you may have a loss of life, a risk that's similar to electric grid failure or a nuclear power plant failure. When you relate it back to the passenger devices used in, in the uh, PISD, that's really your IT aspect where you have the latest and greatest technology going on your aircraft and 
that software could be the most vulnerable in comparison to your, your OT software. So I live in the in-between where IT and OT divide. And I like to coin it as we're like an integrated control system in a commercial environment with OT-like regulation and IT needs from passengers and the business. It's clear as mud sometimes, but that's really what makes my job very, very interesting. And integrated control systems were new for me, and they were super interesting. And I was happy to find out that uh, Department of Homeland Security actually has some great online trainings. If you want to go to that link, you can check out their classes. But it's always the give and take of, do you want to give the government more of your information to sign up to take these classes? So I'll leave that decision up to you. So this is one of my favorite sections of this talk that I lovingly call aviation unicorns. The unicorns are a handful of unique use cases where I've experienced certain items in industry that sets us apart from typical IT and OT environments. And I just like to give a little stories on each. So if you think about software patching and upgrades, this was something I dealt with often back in the in-flight entertainment company. So for software updates, if it was critical, we had the luxury to be flexible enough that we could do same day update, software package release, completely go through the QA cycle, all hands on deck. Sometimes we had to work on nights or over the weekend, but we could get it out to make sure that we met a certain security need. And then we would hand it over to the customer. And the caveat with that is we may provide the software for the system, but the airline owns the system and they own their aircraft. So even though we have the latest update and we hand it over to them, we don't have control over when they actually upload it to the aircraft. And every airline has a different process. So in our industry, what has been a great advantage is the level of communication that suppliers and airlines, any customer relationship is extremely high. We, we have to have that considering how many segments of the supply chain that we have. From an IT standpoint, if you consider your iPhone, software upgrades get pushed and eventually your phone functionality will degrade or get locked and it will automatically push the update, reset your phone. Definitely do not want that to happen on an aircraft. OT systems have the luxury sometimes to say, hey, based on the recommendations of the manufacturer, we may not push this patch now. We have enough compensating controls to mitigate that level of risk based off of what that vulnerability or security issue might be. We're going to wait until we have our normal shutdown period to, to upgrade that part of the system. So, for example, if it's a closed environment, you don't have internet connectivity, it may be okay to wait, but at least the system owner has that option to make that determination. You don't necessarily want either of those to happen on an aircraft. Things need to be done in a timely manner. So how do we combat against this in a unique, our unique situation is that, once again, our defense and depth security. So, for example, software sign, we have roots of trust that exist. Components of the aircraft are embedded systems. They are not open operating systems. You may see Linux systems reboot on the seat back of in-flight entertainment system. It may look like it's Red Hat or a different version of Linux. It is so pared down. They, they rip out as much as possible and use the bare minimum of functionality that they need to help mitigate risk that could be from just an open version of that. And also my favorite example is, especially on the aircraft, some of the software can only be loaded via an official push. There's literally a switch you have to turn, push the software, turn it back, and, and it's locked. So there's really a lot of different security measures in place to help put those different layers of the onion to make sure that we're more robust. Somebody asked, what exactly are you securing? What type of information and data do you handle? We'll get that to the end. The next unicorn topic is the ever-expanding attack surface. So thank you to IoT to exploding this environment into every which way. I, it never amazes me when I'm checking out Twitter to see uh, what's the latest gadget that's Wi-Fi enabled. And I'm like, do you really need to have Wi-Fi for that? I recently bought a washer and dryer and they had the Wi-Fi option. I was like, no. I'm, I'm not going to do that. So we had this closed environment and opening up just blew apart our attack surface. So the moment we added SATCOM and internet connectivity, you just see your potential vulnerabilities expand. A good example of that would be a lot of the USB ports on aircraft. Initially, they were data and power, and they thought 
they might have functionality that people would want to plug in a USB stick and view their photos on the, the back of the seat or or listen to their music. They just wanted to give passengers more functionality, but realized that people aren't gonna do that because it's already on their phone. So what do they end up doing is they end up turning off the data capabilities. They remove the software off the system that would even use any of that data from that port. So a lot of them are power only. Some airlines are even going to the extent of they're putting epoxy in them <laughs> so that no one can plug anything in, especially if they already have a regular outlet at the seat. But it just, it goes back to risk tolerance of um, what you're willing to do. So the main point is that IoT is consistently on our radar to the extent that my team's title is aviation cybersecurity and IoT technologies. So that made our scope really big, but it, I'm, I'm happy that it incorporates the IoT aspects in regards to the aviation ecosystem. Last unicorn story to tell you. So future state, when you think of over the air updates, it's a great segue because it's already happening for cars, right? From a technology standpoint, why couldn't that happen to aircraft? And the first time I gave this presentation, someone stood up in the audience and was like, that is a horrible idea. And I was like, yes, sir, but you beat me to the punch because I didn't get to what I was going to say yet. But, but the background is, if you think about it from a passenger perspective, if you need to have some sort of software update, right? If the aircraft is on the ground, you want to take advantage of however long you have it, right? So if you have like a short update you can push, that's not going to delay any ongoing flights. Awesome. Let, let's go do that. Some updates may take hours. And luckily, uh, airlines are great to schedule to put it in the hangar. It's going to get some regular maintenance and also do a software update. But sometimes that just doesn't happen. And we really don't want to inconvenience passengers. So the car can do an over-the-air update. Why can't the aircraft? There's a lot of reasons why you don't want to do that. Initial talks are specifically, if we go back to the data domains, that this may make sense to do it in the passenger information and entertainment services domain, right? It's supposed to be the least effective to uh, least critical to safety of flight. Back to the regulatory standards, there's a list of different levels of systems in regards to their safety of flight. And IFE systems are at the bottom. Like you can shut them off no impact, the plane can still function, life goes on. Depending on an IFE vendor or an airline's risk tolerance, also the original equipment manufacturers are involved as well because those systems are being installed on the aircrafts that they create. They all have to be in agreement and talk about the risk tolerance if they want to do that. So you definitely don't want to do any type of over-the-air updates for any, any critical system. Even if your IFE system doesn't update properly, you can shut it down, but you want to still have a graceful failover, right? You want to make sure the software can be backwards compatible. Depending on the type of flight you're on, if you're a long haul carrier that you're doing a 14 hour flight, you may not want to take that risk that software push you do over the air, cause the system to fail, and then you lose the ability for your passengers to purchase items during the flight. That may be a revenue generator for you. Or so many passengers in business class traditionally buy internet, you don't want to lose that revenue as well. So it, it just depends on business model, risk tolerance, which is what I would see the, the future for this to be. Big important points are, is the system robust enough that it can be backwards compatible? What makes me happy to know is that things move very slowly in the aviation industry when it comes to uh, technologies like this. It's not going to happen overnight. There's going to be lots of discussion. There's going to be regulation on it. And just getting those conversations going is something that I'm highlighting right now. Is the chain of custody important for operational flight plans? That's a good question. I, I don't know. But let's talk about that at the end. I think we're doing okay on time. And I'm definitely almost to the end. So how do we deal with all of this? It's the reason why I love working in this industry. We have constant communication with everybody involved in the ecosystem. Everybody's working towards the same common goal. If, if one person has a vulnerability, it's going to spread to other parts of the ecosystem. So we all have to have a proper amount of information sharing. And we're very fortunate to have industry groups like IATA and the Aviation ISAC stands for Information Sharing Analysis Center, be facilitators of that information. So on a daily basis, I am communicating 
with my um, competitors and counterparts in industry to see how we can better share information and notify everybody of whatever vulnerabilities that we see. Also, we are trying to be better to work with the research community. So I have no problem being an advocate to say that we need to keep doing more. I think it's gotten a little bit better in the past year or two, but it's nowhere near enough to where it needs to be. Organizations are finally getting, getting the hint that this needs to be a component that they need to have in their security program. We've seen a handful more of bug bounty programs, vulnerability disclosure programs um, at American we kicked off a coordinated disclosure program that's in its private phase right now, and we're hoping to have that be open or it's later in the year. But it's a process. We need to educate everybody involved, and we continue to need everybody's patience to make sure that everybody gets the information that they need. We, we never condone doing any testing on aircraft, but doing nothing isn't acceptable either. So we need to work on solving the problem of how can both sides be curious while being safe. That's an ongoing item that industry needs to work with the research community to help solve. Regulations state that we need to prove that systems are secure and testing is a way of validation. So all parties need, need to work together. And I feel like slowly that's starting to happen a little bit more, which makes me happy. Another issue that I see is that we do not have enough trained cybersecurity professionals in general Everybody hears that probably at every conference they go to, but it's exacerbated in the aviation industry because not only do you need to understand general security concepts, you need to understand everything else that I mentioned in this presentation. There's times where I feel like, well, I need to be a pilot and I need to know airline and aircraft operations and maintenance while knowing IT and threat intel. And it's, it's a unicorn of a person that doesn't really exist and sounds like the worst job wreck ever. We need to do a better job of growing the knowledge base so that people can learn how to do this and, and help the industry in the future. And that's one of the reasons why I'm giving this presentation. A lot of people feel that it's a security by obscurity. There's just not a lot of information out there. And there is information, but you, it's hard to know where to start. So I hope that this presentation um, helps provide a starting point for anybody who's interested. You can start by doing your homework with a lot of the um, documents that I reference. Some of them are free. Other ones you do have to purchase. But you, we can always start a conversation if you have questions on, on anything in specific. That is it for my main information. These are all the reference slides that I have if you want to know where to find all these documents. And like I said, all these slides are on my website, oliviastella.com. Normally, I give out this awesome sticker uh, when I present in person, so I really want to make sure you guys get stickers somehow. So I'm going to figure out if I can, I don't know, add, add it to swag bag or, or, or mail it out to people. But if you're interested in a sticker, definitely go to my survey and, and give me the honest truth and say, Olivia, send me a sticker, and then I, I will try to make sure that happens. But thank you so much for tuning in to my presentation and big, huge thanks to the crew of Wild West Hacking Fest. When I heard things were getting a little more serious in California, I got worried and was really afraid that the conference was going to get canceled. And I was just so grateful that they decided to turn it virtual. So thanks again. Really appreciate everybody's time. Keep the conversation going. Find me on my Twitter handle, Olivia Curls, and we can keep talking. Thank you so much for being here and for giving your talk today. Awesome. Thank you. I think I have maybe a couple minutes for questions. So Absolutely. Yeah, let me let me scroll back. And there is no one after you, so if you do go a little long, feel free. Um, oh, awesome. Okay. So Box Swapper was asking, are the policy books available in digital format or paper? Um, both, but the um, organization that develops all of these documents you have to have a membership to get them and they do charge. So depending on who you work for, you may be able to get that. Can you send the white paper? I'm going to guess that was the uh, U.S. government stance on aviation cybersecurity. The link is in my reference section. But if you have a hard time finding it, just reach out and I'll get it to you. Steph was asking for the avionics aspect. What are you securing the information data do you handle? So if you think about it from like a regular um, now, I don't know the answers to all this. I'm just going based off of the system that I worked on, which was the in-flight entertainment system. It has aspects of a traditional network in that you're communicating how data is being transferred back and forth. So for an IFE system, 
It would be the media components, what items are functional. There is some functionality that business class has, maybe that economy doesn't have, or um, I know for, for some airlines, like for shorter flights, they would charge for certain food items or it would be free in business class. I know this isn't probably the info you're looking for. You want more of like the stuff in the aircraft control domain, but that was not what I was trained on. Uh, another question, what's being disabled when doing airplane mode? I'm going to assume that's meant for the cell phone. It's it's nothing bad or, or, or specific. Loving all of the questions. They're like, I plug stuff into these USB ports. I did too. Luckily, I worked for the IFE company and they let me uh, see what could happen. Yeah. It, 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 think of it going back to software updates. There may have been software configurations to stop data flowing, but maybe it didn't get updated yet. So it, it just depends. There is no problem of reaching out to that airline and be like, hey, I, I see this and just take a screenshot. If they happen to have a vulnerability disclosure program, providing the most amount of information you can is very, very helpful because people like me are the ones that run the issue to ground. So we need to know what flight you're on, you can give what's, what seat, what route. And then I'm the one that goes in and tries to figure out what system you are actually. Everybody wants a sticker, I think. Oh, there's a question. What kind of questions do you get from pilots the most? They, they are just generally curious about how we're advancing in cybersecurity. So we're, we're taking better initiatives to try to communicate with them better. And there's a lot more um, industry organizations that are focusing on cybersecurity in regards to uh, pilot activities. So I'm excited about that. How long does it take to make improvements based off of your research? It depends on the level of severity in regards to, are you making a drastic change that could affect the entire aircraft and the ground systems, or is it something of a more dynamic system? So for the um, IFE company, they were always looking for um, newer hardware and what type of software you could throw on it and what type of functionality you could have. There was sensing capabilities where it would know you were there by just walking in front of it. Sometimes people are like, why do things have old S video connectors? Well, back in the day, they wanted to give as many options as possible. And just through um, course of events, I mean, these systems are on the aircraft for years and years. The life of these systems could be anywhere from like 10 to 20 years, depending on how long it's in service. So even though you look at it and you're like, it's silly back at the time, it could have been more late breaking. If it's a more dynamic system, it, it could be in a couple of years. Honestly, like everybody else is experiencing, it's time and resources and money. I don't think I see any other questions. So with that, thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate it. This has been fun. I want to give a quick plug to uh, Box Swapper. He has his own aviation presentation tomorrow always wanting to help get more info about our industry out there. So check that out tomorrow. And thanks, everyone.